They set out from New York, a showman, his handsome best friend, a soldier of fortune, and a beautiful actress, navigating the high seas towards the shores of the mysterious Skull Island, a place which, if it exists, holds both danger and opportunity. A collision of worlds that will bring the most fearsome beast in existence from his forgotten realm to the modern city. We're talking today about the original King Kong from 1933, a movie whose story of thrilling adventure and its star, a marvel of movie magic, has gone on to inspire as many filmmakers and special effects men as it did audiences at the time of its release. I think most people forget or overlook the metatextual element of Kong's story, the idea that this whole endeavor of journeying to Skull Island was predicated on producing the most astounding, jaw-dropping spectacle of a motion picture anyone had ever seen. Throw your arms across your eyes and scream, and scream for your life! In that way, the story of the film mirrors its actual production, the movie's characters based on their creators, real-world thrill-seekers, globetrotters, and war heroes, Ernst B. Shostak and Marion C. Cooper, two men who created a blockbuster movie for all time. But in addition to having a son, uh, revealed in a lesser sequel, King Kong also had many fathers, many creatives, without whose contribution, the movie and cinema history in general would have never been the same. It's my aim to highlight all of these remarkable people who had a hand in making the film King Kong, and in the process, pay homage to the cinema's greatest movie monster. Hi guys, I'm George. Thanks so much for coming back to my film journal. Without further ado, let's get started. King Kong begins with a pitch from the energetic and dogmatic Carl Denham, a movie producer and adventurer whose wildlife documentaries apparently could benefit from a little romantic flavor. If this picture had love interest, it would gross twice as much. All right, the public wants a girl, and this time I'm going to give them what they want. Fortuitously, Denham collides with the beautiful Anne Darrow, played by Faye Ray, and convinces her to join him in his harebrained scheme to travel to an uncharted island to seek fortune glory, and cinematic greatness. Anywhere is better than the grimy streets of Depression-era America for Anne. She wants an escape, the promise of adventure and possibility. And for the audiences of the time, that escape was the movies. Released only a month after the infamous bank holiday, declared by FDR, in which the financial institutions of the country were forcibly closed to avoid a full-scale bank run. But that didn't prevent the audience from lining up in droves to hand over what little spending money they had to witness the majesty of King Kong. Kong's principal creator, Marion C. Cooper, and his partner, Ernst B. Shostak, were the animating force behind the film, and these were two guys who had lived rather astounding lives before their foray into Hollywood. Cooper had served as a pilot in World War I and had crash-landed, his hands and arms burned to disfigurement. He landed the plane safely by flying with his knees. He crash-landed again after volunteering to fight the communists in Poland, was captured and served an 11-month prison stint in a Russian camp, escaping on foot and cutting a Bolshevik soldier's throat in the attempt. Shostak ran away from his home in Iowa at 14 to work on a road crew. He fought as a bomber pilot, a cameraman in World War I, suffering lasting damage to his left eye, which remarkably, didn't preclude his lifelong career as a movie director. Cooper and Shostak, the duo are dead ringers for their counterparts on screen, Denim and Driscoll, and after meeting in France after the war, became lifelong friends, seeing flight and the motion picture business as two sides of the same coin, that of 20th century scientific advancement. They began filming documentaries in far-flung regions in Persia and Thailand, before transitioning into narrative film. Now, you know, you have all these, you know, action films and things being made by directors who do MTV and have no sense of life. And then you have this movie done by these guys who had adventures in a time when taking those adventures was hard, physically brutal, dragging this camera equipment around, just like these guys are doing yeah. in the movie, and really putting their life on the line all the time. And they brought that to this movie. You can feel the authenticity of it, despite the fantasy element. The crew set sail for their uncharted destination, and the movie is off. During their voyage on the steamship venture, Anne falls for its first mate, the handsome, no-nonsense man's man, Jack Driscoll, played by Bruce Cabot, an actor who would go on to play many cowboy roles alongside John Wayne. 
Cabot, I think, is rather flat here. He doesn't hold a candle to Fay Ray's vulnerability and charm, illustrated here in one of their romantic moments. You can see a blushing eagerness to be loved in Ray's eyes, her glowing face, how she can convey this girlish longing for companionship, as well as this mature, provocative sexuality. And then Cabot's just sort of ladling out goofy lines with an aw shucks delivery. You don't feel anything like that about me, do you? It's tough, and Cabot is never anything other than one-dimensional in this movie. It makes me wish the filmmakers would have opted for their original choice of Joel McRae in the lead. McRae was actually filming the most dangerous game for Cooper and Shostak simultaneously. So simultaneously, in fact, that that film reused many of Kong's jungle sets in its production. I think McRae generally brings a good-naturedness and affability to all of his roles, a quality that's lacking in Cabot. And it would have been useful playing alongside Robert Armstrong's denim. As the film stands, they're always in lockstep together throughout the adventure, with Cabot as second banana to Armstrong, who really carries the scenes. I think you would have had a nice dynamic, and an actor like McRae might have brought some moral nuance to the proceedings, rather like the dynamic between Adrian Brody and Jack Black in Peter Jackson's remake. Let go! Oh, I'm not leaving the camera on you, is it? Speaking of the jungle sets and overall atmosphere and energy of Skull Island, there's something so otherworldly and transportive about them, based as they were on the paintings of 19th century French artist Gustave Doré, at the suggestion of effects man Willis O'Brien. Doré was best known for his biblical works and illustrations of Milton's Paradise Lost, the story of Satan's fall from grace, and Adam and Eve's temptation in the garden. What stands out most to me in Doré's paintings in relationship to King Kong is the ancientness of the foliage, the flora and fauna, the sheer unchartedness of the forests, as if they had been created by God a millennia ago and left to grow over each other and twist their way to the heavens of their own volition, unchecked before the arrival of man. And in many ways, Skull Island is sort of a Garden of Eden by way of Darwin, in that it is incredibly Hobbesian. We are constantly confronted with the day-to-day kill-or-be-killed environment the depth and mystery of Skull Island's jungle accentuated by the filmmaker's thrilling use of multi-plane cameras and the new technology of the optical printer, wherein multiple layers of film and disparate pieces can be placed together to create one image. This is used to great effect in Kong's cave. The beauty of miniature rear projection is that you can take a live action plate that you've shot and essentially project it onto a tiny screen that's built into the miniature so that in effect you're making a composite right there in front of camera. And then of course you're projecting one frame at a time. So you advance a frame in the projector, then you do your animation in the front, you photograph it, advance the frame in the projector again and so forth. The king of all these many strange beasts is of course Kong himself, a marvel of special effects conceived by Cooper as part of his obsession with apes a dream he could finally achieve after witnessing the stop-motion animation work of Willis O'Brien. O'Brien, a professional archaeologist, ranch hand, and boxer, had gotten his start in the film business crafting stop-motion shorts for Thomas Edison's film company. His breakout film being Harry O. Hoyt's The Lost World, an adaption of the novel by Arthur Conan Doyle. So impressed was Doyle with the rough cuts of the film that he attempted to pass them off as genuine to his friend Harry Houdini, during a meeting of the Society of American Magicians. He showed the footage and then refused to elaborate when asked about its origins. The dinosaurs, who seemed to be magically animated and imbued with life, apparently caused such a kerfuffle that the New York Times reported on the occasion. Dinosaurs cavort in film for Doyle. Spiritist mystifies world-famed magicians with pictures of prehistoric beasts. Later, Conan Doyle wrote to Houdini to offer a light apology for the exhibition. The dinosaurs and other monsters have been constructed by pure cinema, but of the highest kind, and are being used for the Lost World picture. I am sure they will forgive me if for a few short hours I had them guessing. All this basically illustrates how new the marvelous art of stop motion was to the audiences of the time and how adept O'Brien was at bringing these creatures to life. I love Doyle's quote, cinema of the highest kind. And Cooper was equally impressed by O'Brien's work. Not by the lost world exactly, but by footage of his potential masterwork, the unmade film Creation, a film with a ballooning budget that found itself canceled and scrapped by the struggling RKO Studios. Founded in 1929 and in danger of bankruptcy, 
by 1931. Cooper saw the potential in creation, its dinosaur characters, environment, and set pieces, most famously a log bridge sequence in which adventurers fall into a ravine. This and many more sequences were ported over to King Kong. The creation of Kong himself and the process of bringing him to life is a confounding confrontation with the extent of patience and meticulous attention to detail that can exist within one man. From the building of his skeletal armature, clay musculature, and fur made from rabbit hair, to the painstaking manipulation of this little puppet, frame by frame. You can't help but be awed by it today. The sheer force of creativity and ingenuity behind the effects carried the day. The humanity behind Kong's movements, facial expressions, and the little quirks and habits he had, along with the personality imbued in him by O'Brien, managed to endear a giant monster to generations of audiences and children. It inspired film industry greats like Ray Harryhausen, who learned from and then ended up perfecting the technique devised by O'Brien. Harryhausen, having been given his first shot in the industry as an assistant to O'Brien on the Cooper Showstack production of Mighty Joe Young, their third gorilla picture. And from King Kong, we see a sort of genealogy of special effects men from Harryhausen and his work in the 50s and 60s to the Industrial Light and Magic alumni, Phil Tippett, Dennis Murren, and Ken Ralston, all the way down to Peter Jackson, and I'm sure many more who have been swept away by this truly personal form of animation, which, as we get further away from the singular vision of one creative individual and further towards sweatshop conditions and oppressive computer work, seems so much more lovely, simple, and honest. Kong's initial first appearance is a real shock, a real treat, when he finally arrives. Sold, of course, by O'Brien's delicate work, as well as Fay Ray's utterly convincing shock. And we can't count out composer Max Steiner, who withheld music from the film until the crew arrives at Skull Island. Wall-to-wall -wall music had been a staple of silent film, of course, but with the advent of sound, many producers were shy about including what they saw as unmotivated music in a new medium, which sought to achieve realism. They postulated, wrongly, that audiences might ask, where is the music coming from? In the film Symphony of Six Million, Steiner began to do something unique, laying down underlying music and specific themes for certain characters, using music to ramp up suspense and tension. Steiner was even so meticulous as to identify the pitch in which certain actors spoke in order to create music that wouldn't clash with their dialogue. Half of the power of Kong's initial frightening appearance and his pathos in later sequences in the city comes from Steiner's music. The music actually allows for O'Brien's work on Kong to breathe, for him to make slow shuffling movements. I'd even say that O'Brien overshot his mandate, as in Kong has way more charisma than maybe Cooper and Shostak initially intended. Did they really know before the film came out that people would weep as Kong fell to his death? Could they have imagined that this hideous beast who kidnaps our poor heroine, crushes tribesmen beneath his feet, bites people's heads off, tosses sailors to their demise from a suspended log, or drops an innocent woman to her death, would end up enduring himself to so many across the world? Further incarnations of the Kong mythos find fault in Carl Denham's character and actions and essentially turn him into a money-grubbing opportunist, an unscrupulous guy who enslaves poor Kong just to make a buck. But Denham here in this movie is played up basically as a hero, or at least the movie never calls attention to any of his bad behavior. Even Anne and Driscoll are willing to completely buy into the humiliating pageant that Kong has been subjected to at film's end. I wouldn't have brought you, but... Well, you know how Denham insisted. Of course, we had to come when he said it would help the show. Which seems sort of morally incongruous with how the public has come to perceive the Kong story as a rather tragic and unfair parable. Even the concurrent film, The Most Dangerous Game, puts big game hunter McRae in the position of hunted, forcing him to reevaluate the ethics of his endeavors. He didn't hate me for stalking him any more than I hated him for trying to charge me. As a matter of fact, we admired each other. Perhaps. But would you change places with the tiger? Well, not now. I feel like they might have even done work to correct this when in the less than spectacular Son of Kong, which was turned around quickly in the very same year, no less, Denham spends a lot of time coping with his culpability for Kong's death, trying even to redeem himself by saving another monster, ostensibly Kong's son. 
I must be completely cuckoo to be doing this. Giving you a first aid treatment instead of running like blazes. Because it must be remorse or something. You see, I'm the guy that knocked out your pop with a gas bomb and then carried him off to New York in chains. I've been sorry for it ever since. <laughs> but in the end, Kong scales one of the newest and most impressive structures that the modern world has to offer, the Empire State Building, where he dukes it out with biplanes. It's just so fantastic and a terrific idea, so iconic, it's unbelievable. And seasoned pilots Marion C. and Ernest B. in their cameos are the ones who ultimately take him out. After the arduous 66-day production, Cooper was quoted as saying, Let's kill the son of a bitch ourselves. Which is interesting when you consider that writers Marion C. and Ernest B. killed Kong in the script, their stand-in characters Denim and Driscoll devise Kong's killing in the third act, and then the filmmakers portray the Trigger Man on screen. And of course, Kong falls to his cinematic death. A death which in turn made him immortal. In a myriad of remakes and sequels and reboots, and in the mind of the public where Kong has become symbolic of New York City and in certain ways of golden age Hollywood filmmaking. The film was a smash hit and saved the fledgling RKO studio from receivership and was re-released many, many times. But after 1938, the newly formed Hays Code demanded the more grisly sequences of Kong wantonly murdering villagers and helpless apartment dwelling ladies that we mentioned earlier were excised and thought lost until an unvarnished print was discovered in Philadelphia in 1968 and released by Janus Films in 69, with all the pre-code goodness included. The movie was even the subject of the first release by Criterion in 1989, along with Citizen Kane, which I think says a lot about the esteem this film has garnered since its release. Available on Laserdisc, Kong was the subject of the very first home video audio commentary by film historian Ronald Haver, a commentary track which is notoriously difficult to find and only available on the Laserdisc edition. If anyone has a hookup, please let me know. Guys, thanks so much for tuning into my channel. The likes, comments, and subscriptions really help drive the algorithm and bring more new people into the channel. I'm trying to grow. And if you like these videos and you would like to afford me the ability to make more of them more consistently, please consider donating me on Patreon for a $3 tier. Uh, you guys get like 40 old videos that I took off YouTube that you can watch of lots of movie reviews and special fun things on there that I think you might enjoy. Only $3. You can watch them all in a month and then stop paying, but the three bucks really helps. I, I appreciate it. So King Kong is a very special movie to me because I first encountered it as a kid in 2005 when Peter Jackson's remake was coming out. I was so excited for that movie, being a, such a big fan of Lord of the Rings. It might have been one of the first times, too, that I was aware of like a director being behind a movie and that I was excited to see his next effort. And I watched it on Turner Classic Movies because they made a big deal about it, and um, to their eternal credit. And I, I just fell in love with King Kong. I got the audiobook adaption of the um, 1932 novelization that was based on the script, which predated the movie. And I listened to it all the time. I even made a stop motion animated uh, film with a little monkey stuffed animal I had because I was just in. in raptured with this idea that as a solitary person, you could come up with a sort of stop motion thing and make a movie on your own. At that time, as a really young kid, I didn't have a whole lot of resources to make a big ex extravagant film. But, um, you know, I consider myself, I guess it's fun to think of myself as modest as my as my efforts have been uh, in filmmaking. Part of that genealogy of people that were inspired by it, inspired to like pick up a camera and do something. Um, and for whatever reason, cinema and a big gorilla is just, they just work well together. I don't know what it is. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in. I really appreciate uh, all the growth the channel has been getting. And I hope you enjoyed this video and have a happy holiday. So I'll see you next time.